So hi everyone again, my name is Naila. I'm current WIE NSW uh, Affinity Group Chair. Um, and thank you to our speakers, Professor Katina and Dr. Roba for joining us today. And thank you all for um, joining the session as well. As session is about navigating competitive um, grant application processes. So they'll be talking about um, uh, grant, uh, how, how to go through grant applications, how, uh, how to form teams, interdisciplinary teams uh, involving engineering, information system, technology-based disciplines, and we'll discuss uh, some tips and thoughts uh, regarding that as well. So our uh, speakers, our presenters today are uh, Professor Katina. Uh, she's professor at uh, Arizona State University, a senior global future scientist in global future laboratory, and has joined the Appointment in School of Future of Innovation and Society and School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence. She's director of Society um, Policy Engineering Collectives and founding editor-in-chief of IEEE Transaction and Technology and Society. Uh, Katina is senior member of IEEE and was the founding chair of the first global accredited master's of science uh, degree in public interest technology at ASU. She has uh, worked at different, uh, different uh, companies and she has held three international symposia on technology and society in Wollongong, Toronto, and uh, Finnish. She is senior editor of socio economic impact section in IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine and was the editor-in-chief of award-winning IEEE Technology and Society Magazine. Thank you so much, Professor Katina, for joining in. Thank you, Naima. Our second, our second presenter is Dr. Roba Abbas. She is lecturer and academic program uh, director with the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Wollongong, Australia. She has a PhD in location-based service regulation and has received competitive grants for research addressing global challenges in areas related to co-design and social technical systems, operation management, robotics, social media, and other emerging technology. Her current uh, research interests include methodological approaches to complex social uh, technical system design. Um, more recently, uh, she has delivered talks and co-organized panels uh, for different institutes um, at Arizona State University and um, Australia University of Applied Sciences. Uh, she's co-editor of IEEE Transaction Technology and Society and was a technical program chair of um, IEEE International Symposium on Technology and Society. Uh, and she, uh, from 2015 to 2010, she was a product manager with Internetrix Wollongong. Thank you so much, Yoba, for joining in today. Uh, so we'll start and I'll hand over the session to Professor Katina and Dr. Robo. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Naila, for that introduction and to the IEEE WIE New South Wales Chapter Affinity Group for the opportunity to present this webinar with my colleague, Professor Katina Michael. Uh, before I begin or before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land upon which we virtually meet today um, pay, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Uh, Today, we will be providing you with some insights and information, as Naila mentioned, about navigating competitive grant processes, focusing on some background information to inform some practical exercises uh, that we hope you'll find valuable, uh, which will follow, uh, which are relevant to the grant application process. Now, on the next slide, in terms of outline, we'll cover some background information. So, for example, we'll provide you with a bit more context about us in our work, just to set the scene and give you a sense of um, a framing for the discussion. We'll then go on to provide a brief introduction to grant writing in terms of the different types of grant opportunities available. Uh, in addition to an overview of our first national competitive grant together, um, in addition to other background details, an overview of opportunities and challenges, factors involved in working in multi and interdisciplinary teams and some tips and strategies before moving on to that practical discussion of those practical exercises and reflections, uh, including um, reflecting on uh, past, present and the future, the qualities of a researcher and other exercises relating to scoping the grant, looking at research architectures and uh, coverage, defining project grant lists, configuring roles and defining your research network and locating appropriate grant schemes. Um, so we'll try to get through as much of that as 
possible there's quite a lot to uh, get through after which we'll happily take some questions uh, on the next slide in terms of background i'll start off with some background about me before handing over to katina both in terms of academic background and also more specifically involvement with the ieee so i was awarded my undergraduate studies in information and communication technology majoring specifically in business information systems from the university of Wollongong in 2006 after which i spent some time in industry, specifically in web design and development, before returning to complete a PhD in location based services regulation, also at the University of Wollongong. And although I've been working in various uh, contract based roles simultaneously at Wollongong University since about 2007, I began full time employment in the Faculty of Business in law and Law in 2018. And this is my current role where in addition to my research and my teaching work in the operations and information systems space, I'm also the academic program director in our school. As for the IEEE, I've assumed various roles, some of which include my current role as co-editor of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society, and I was also formerly the administrator and associate editor for the IEEE Technology and Society magazine, and I've also served uh, as the IEEE Standards Association Working Group member for Standard P2089, uh, Technical Program Chair for the IEEE International Symposium on Technology and Society. And last year, I was also involved with the IEEE Australia Council as their Student Activities Coordinator. I might hand over just briefly to you, Katina, to introduce your background and involvement with the IEEE. Thank you so much, Roba. And thank you, Roba, for the invitation to present with you today. It's such an honor. Uh, and to Naila and everyone who's come, my thanks. Uh, similar sort of non-traditional trajectory to Roba, um, I uh, had the good fortune of uh, being offered an opportunity both at UNSW and UTS to do a scholarship degree in IT. And uh, I took the UTS route. It was more a technology-based route, uh, but also finished in three years instead of four. And that was one of my reasons why I chose the degree at UTS, but also because it had such an amazing mixture of coursework. Uh, we were nestled in the School of Computing and Mathematical Sciences. And I can say that some of the discrete mathematics and quantitative modeling I did there uh, kept me on my toes, but also some of those networking subjects, uh, business subjects, financial mathematics, uh, econom economics, organizational theory, and much more uh, put me on a trajectory that said, life would be interdisciplinary. It was a sandwich degree. We did all that coursework in two years. And for a year, we spent in industry, six months in different locations. And I was able to be located at Anderson Consulting, uh, working on the Caltex Ampol project, uh, and also Otis Elevator Company. So on the one hand, a consulting company uh, doing IT and business process, uh, implementing SAP R3. Uh, and on the other hand, basically looking at a manufacturing floor where safety and quality was of essence. I later enrolled uh, for going about 30 or so job opportunities uh, in 1996, uh, decided to do a master's degree, which ended up becoming a, a PhD at the University of Wollongong. And I spent so long there on campus, uh, I was employed at the same time as studying. So there I was one Sunday morning, opening up the newspaper and lo and behold, I saw an advertisement for Nortel Networks. They were looking for network engineers. And I thought, I'll throw my hat in. I'm doing coursework at the university that year. Uh, and lo and behold, I get a job as a graduate engineer. And life took on there, uh, where I was constantly traveling, doing uh, pre-sales engineering bid responses uh, throughout Asia, uh, Canada, and the US for about five to six years. Later, I enrolled in a Master's of Transnational Crime Prevention in the Faculty of Law at the University of Wollongong, again on scholarship uh, through one of our postgraduate programs while I was there. Uh, and I'm still enrolled as an ongoing student, but I won't announce that one until I finish. Um, spent the greater part of 18 years straight at the University of Wollongong as an academic since uh, around about late 2001, uh, first as a tutor, then as a lecturer, uh, and then life took on uh, its own mission from there, learning uh, what academia was about and becoming uh, embedded in its processes, very different to industry, might I add. Um, some years ago, tapped on the shoulder to join the wonderful Arizona State University, where I've been ever since 2018, although I've been working loosely with them since around mid-2017 on grant writing and other things. 
uh, I just can't express my gratitude to ASU. Uh, the work is highly transdisciplinary. I'm nestled between two schools now. I teach into di different programs. I've had the opportunity to be a founding chair in a Masters of Science in Public Interest Technology, a new domain of study um, with some very important ties to socio-technical theory and much more, uh, and found myself directing a, a 13 group uh, person group in society policy and engineering, amalgamating the social sciences and the engineering together, uh, of which we are participants in something called the Global Futures Laboratory um, in the College of Global Futures. With respect to IEEE, uh, a joy in parallel to my uh, industry and academic work, uh, I've had the pleasure of being an editor-in-chief in several outlets uh, and more recently given my heart and soul to the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society, where I work so closely with Roba uh, in uh, engaging uh, international scholars to contribute and think about technology and society topics, those crossovers. Uh, I have been involved over the last two and a bit years with the IEEE Standards Association, uh, also chaired a number of our ISTAS IEEE conferences and uh, had the joy of being the recipient of a number of awards and actively involved in the Board of Governors of both the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technology and the IEEE Council on RFID. So that's a bit of a summary on my background. Over to you, Robo. Thanks so much, Katina. And I think you said it correctly. It's a bit of a summary. We could have included many more slides there. Um, and it's just such a fascinating story. So thank you for sharing it. Uh, Together, Katina and I, we thought we'd share a bit of information just very briefly about the type of work that we do in addition to what Katina just mentioned. Uh, so together, we've been working for over 16 years now at the intersection of society, technology, ethics and regulation, collaborating initially on projects relevant to cybersecurity, public sector information availability and systems and critical infrastructure protection. Uh, right now, we've uh, or uh, since then, we have um, worked on projects into looking into location-based services regulation and other emerging technologies, specifically at the socio-ethical and, as Katina mentioned, some of the socio-technical implications of emerging technologies. And we've now extended this work to focus on sustainable transdisciplinary transitions is quite a mouthful toward public interest technology and so that's a bit of just insight into some of our work together uh, on the next slide um, in terms of uh, moving on to the introduction to this grant writing uh, or grant writing processes webinar and navigating the process i think in an academic setting as you're probably well aware Grant writing is a significant activity, one that can be quite intensive in terms of time commitment, quite daunting with respect to where we start um, or where to start, and difficult to navigate as a process in general, particularly for PhD candidates, uh, postdoctoral researchers and early career researchers. Uh, what um, this presentation will cover is some key details about the process in general, and here I'll commence by identifying some of the grant opportunities that are available to us as academics or as early career researchers um, or as researchers in general. Uh, the first, which is sort of in that central area, is the school-based grants within a particular institution that are made available to academic staff members. And these can include things such as startup funding when you join an institution, in addition to other schemes, depending on your specific institution. If we move up a level, there are your faculty grants, which depending on your institution can overlap with the school level opportunities and additionally can provide things such as mentoring and other opportunities to explore. As we make our way up to the next level, so the institutional level, this could refer to seed funding schemes. And often we see it, certainly at the University of Wollongong, some cross campus or cross faculty opportunities that encourage projects relevant to multiple disciplines. And that's something that I've certainly accessed and found quite beneficial uh, at my institution. And beyond the institutional level, there are a range of other opportunities in your cross institutional funding. So a range of different, institutions collaborating together and submitting grants on that basis. Um, there's national competitive grant schemes such as the Australian Research Council schemes and also other international funding opportunities. So as you may appreciate, there are many ways to access 
funding and a range of different uh, at a range of different levels excuse me uh, we thought it um, might be useful to provide just an insight into some of the awarded grants so on the next slide please Katina um, this is one of the first grants that Katina and I worked on together. It was funded by the Australian Research Council Discovery Grant Scheme, and it was on the topic area of location-based services regulation in Australia. And this was funded, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Katina, in 2007, 2008, and we started work officially in 2009 and under the leadership of uh, Katina, who was the chief investigator on that project. And as we'll hopefully see as we progress throughout this seminar or this webinar, uh, uh, sometimes you might access a particular grant scheme that uh, results in ensuing work or in, in, in subsequent work over a period of time. And this is certainly the case with this particular grant scheme, which we used as a springboard to other relevant um, topic areas, to other grants, to other, uh, I guess, theoretical and methodological contributions since the start of this particular uh, project together. And we've listed some of the outcomes on our screen. So uh, discovery based outcomes in the form of regulatory frameworks and socio-ethical issues surrounding location based services. And we've since used this as the basis for other work into public interest technology, extending socio-technical systems theory, and also other methodological approaches to the way we design design systems uh, on the basis of collaboration or using collaborative and participatory approaches. On the next slide, I just thought I'd provide an overview of some of the grants that uh, I've been uh, awarded with my colleagues since um, commencing employment in uh, 2018. And the following slide will show those that I have not been successful in achieving. And that's a very important message that I think Katina will touch on as well as part of her talk. Um, this shows sort of the separation and also uh, links back to that diagram we showed of grants awarded at different levels. So for instance, at the faculty level, I was fortunate enough to be involved in a mentoring grant with the Faculty of Business. In terms of institutional, and that's predominantly around the idea of multi and interdisciplinary projects uh, with my colleagues at the University of Wollongong. I've been um, fortunate enough to be involved in projects around social media, uh, robotics, the digital state, so public information or public sector information systems, and also things around um, uh, human to robot skill transfer from a social ethical technical and legal perspective. And those institutional based uh, grants, I guess, were supported and funded by the University of Wollongong's Global Challenges seed funding. And I found that this was a really good way to initially when I started full time employment to access certain schemes to form co new collaborations as well to supplement existing collaborations and a really good way to engage in multi and interdisciplinary research. And also at the international level in collaboration with the University of Duisburg Essen in Germany, uh, we're involved in a travel a grant scheme or we were awarded a travel uh, grant and that's currently on hold due to the pandemic but we hope to start that up soon or as soon as possible. On the following slide, um, I thought it was really important to list the other side of the story. So while we focus a lot or we might see on social media and um, reported either within our institutions or elsewhere, the successes, it's really important to note that for every success, there is um, a, a declined attempt as they label it. And Katina and I, as we were preparing for this talk and in general, we, we like to discuss some um, sort of the terminology around grant funding. And we spoke about the term failure. So we, we don't like that terminology. So we don't even necessarily um, like the decline terminology either. We see this as an opportunity for further learning or as a mechanism to improve our projects and then resubmit. Um, and I think that's a really helpful way, at least from my perspective, to think about it. So there have been many unsuccessful attempts of which I've listed them on your screen. So at the institutional level, there have been two uh, cross institutional one one New South Wales government grant, two ARC DECRA grants, and three international grants that have been unsuccessful. Um, and I hope to repurpose all of those. So the institutional ones have been repurposed and since funded. And my um, ARC submission, I hope to resubmit to another uh, funding scheme. So I think um, something that's valuable to note here is that when you receive feedback there are ways in which you can convert that feedback into uh, I, I guess your revisions and embed those into future iterations of the project and it's helpful in so many um or from so many perspectives on the next slide thank you um katina 
uh, I thought it'd be uh, nice to include some opportunities and challenges, particularly uh, specific to uh, women in higher education, women in STEM, and also women in engineering in terms of uh, what the opportunities are, but also some of the challenges that we face. And I won't elaborate too much on, on this, but I do have some readings if anyone's interested. Uh, I think what we've established in our background thus far is that there are many research opportunities in general at varying levels in STEM more specifically and in engineering there are quite um, uh, I guess promising funding schemes and opportunities that we are able to access and a range of diverse grant schemes and there's also the increased recognition and um, of the importance of mentorship for early career researchers, for PhD students, for postdocs, and for everyone in general. So I've been um, uh, accessing mentoring and mentorship schemes, both formal and informal, uh, since uh, the commencement of my career. Uh, so there is early career support that can be accessed, and there's also a range of equity and diversity programs across universities. And now in terms of the other side of that um, that story there are a range of challenges that have been documented in the literature and also experienced in terms of real life lived experience and they are that um, women tend to be underrepresented in stem disciplines um, there's also uh, ideas around that have been documented in some of the sources i have on the screen around contributions of females and women in team-based environments um, sometimes being downplayed or not credited as they should be there's also less involvement in terms of those external academic tasks with an emphasis on internal uh, or a higher governance workload within institutions. Women in general, as per the sources that I've got on your screen, submit fewer proposals. They also have lower success rates, which Katina, you might touch on um, during your talk. I'm not sure, maybe we can do so in the discussion. Um, there are a range of other barriers um, for females in, uh, or female early career researchers more specifically, uh, due to the fact that they often have other duties in, a range, in addition to a range of other challenges relating to the grant right process itself. So we can spend a whole uh, webinar talking about some of these challenges and unpacking those. But just in the interest of time, I might just move on to the next slide, please. Um, something that I found really helpful in terms of understanding um, the current landscape where grant writing and research is concerned in general is how we form multi and interdisciplinary teams. So the idea of how do we collaborate um, in order to enrich the grant writing process. And a lot of the funded opportunities that I listed previously, in addition to some of my long-term collaborations with Katina and our uh, team at large, have heavily dependent, depended excuse me, on that multi and, and interdisciplinary aspect. And we hope to also move beyond to a transdisciplinary vision and a transdisciplinary trajectory for our work. Within the context of multi and interdisciplinary teams, and this slide is built and, and created based on lived experience across a range of multidisciplinary projects over time. There are a range of things that I think we can take away from those experiences, uh, just in general, in terms of tips and techniques. Um, one thing in particular is around the articulation of the project aims and objectives. So often in multi and interdisciplinary teams, and certainly transdisciplinary teams, there is a different type of vocabulary or different aims and objectives more so, um, depending on your disciplinary perspective or the various disciplinary perspective. And one of the major and preliminary roles is being able to uh, reconcile those disciplinary perspectives into something that is cohesive and that makes sense and that can be articulated to a funding body or uh, can be articulated in a manner that's clearly expressed within a particular grant application. Another thing is, um, being quite open in terms of the anticipated project outcomes and quite realistic. And that relates to the following point on the screen, which is the ability to define a common vocabulary to allow for clear communication and discussion. And that's something that takes quite a lot of time, um, certainly in, in my experience and in my experience with Katina, to be able to get to the point where we're speaking the same language across disciplines. So whether it's engineering, information sciences, business, or any other disciplines that come together to solve a particular challenge or problem, defining that common vocabulary is key. So I've got a number of projects I've been working on for the past few years that after a two year period, we've actually come to the point where we're speaking the same language and we know how to map certain, uh, I guess, vocabulary from one particular discipline to the other. 
Uh, one thing that I've come to appreciate more is that new collaborations or collaborations in general take time um, and we need to sort of stick to um, or commit to that endeavour over time rather than expecting uh, our efforts to reap, um, to reap outcomes immediately. There's also um, the notion of complexity of working across disciplinary boundaries, particularly as we work towards a transdisciplinary agenda. So being able to work within the context of multiple or potentially multiple methodologies, multiple theoretical frameworks, and being able to reconcile these different stakeholder perspectives and disciplinary backgrounds in a meaningful manner so that you're working towards uh, the fulfillment uh, of a particular research aim or objective. One thing that's quite important is to be realistic with respect to expectations, so not to expect things to uh, happen overnight, not to expect the vocabulary across disciplinary areas to be mapped immediately, and um, to just be really realistic and respectful in terms of, um, uh, of what you expect of the project, what the kind of outcomes are, and to clearly express that to team members. And the last one, which I think is the most important one, or one a very important point at least is not to be disheartened if a reorientation is, is required so as you're going about the prior points if you need to reorient the project direction uh, the anticipated outcomes the expectations the objectives and so on that's okay and and things don't always work out as anticipated and sometimes you need to know when it's sort of uh, when you need to change direction and reorient and that that is not in addition to our discussion earlier about failures, that is not a failure. That's just part of engaging in multi and interdisciplinary teams and part of that complexity. On uh, the next slide, uh, I might talk about um, some of the tips and strategies, which are sort of framed as the do's and don'ts of competitive grant writing, but in line with that positive um, approach that we're hoping to take here, I've got the do's uh, set on the slide and the don'ts are sort of the opposite or the inverse of that. Uh, so. One thing that we cannot stress um, uh, stress enough is the importance of planning and drafting your application early. And I'm very excited to hear what Katina's got to say around the planning process because she's got such incredible ideas around practical tips and guidance as to how we plan, how we draft the application and all the background work that's required before getting to that planning and drafting uh, stage. And I've been fortunate enough to access some of that mentorship around that. So um, I can't wait to hear what Katina's got to say in that regard from a practical perspective. Um, the next point is just so important and I think warrants just a bit of time to unpack. I think we need to be really proactive in seeking mentorship and mentorship does not come in one form but is one of the most important things associated with not just academic grant writing processes but I think the academic journey in general. So I've listed the different kinds of mentors that I have um found to be very helpful and very fortunate to have access and hopefully you'll find them equally as valuable. So I think it's important to have a general mentor relevant to a particular funding scheme, someone perhaps who sits on um, the College of Experts or reviews a, a grant application processes, who knows the actual process inside out and can assist you from a general perspective. But there are other types of mentorship opportunities so that you can um, have potentially or seek a potentially a specific mentor that is relevant to a particular project or research area. You may have multiple experienced mentors and colleagues who have worked with you in the past, uh, are quite familiar with your research work and your research trajectory and are able to be uh, quite direct and explicit in terms of the feedback that they provide. And I think a really important one is having collaborators as mentors and that is ties to the, to the prior point that I mentioned. Um, Another do of competitive grant writing is to be proactive in defining collaboration opportunities beyond your immediate uh, network, I guess. And while it's important to have those sustained networks and collaborations, it's also important to go beyond that and look at defining new collaboration opportunities. Be open to feedback at all stages of the process. And I'll be keen in, on hearing what Katina has to say about the feedback aspect also, um, and to view feedback and unsuccessful grants as learning mechanisms rather than failures. And um, that's been probably one of my biggest takeaways from experiencing grant writing um, in general is that there's a way in which I like to view it that makes it okay for me to submit multiple grant applications without the fear of having them sort of pushed back or declined um, in inverted commas, is that an unsuccessful grant is an opportunity to submit to an alternate grant scheme and to refine my project and tease that as a springboard uh, for project enhancement. 
And finally, tied to that point is the idea of being persistent and to keep trying throughout that process. Okay, so I'll just finish up with documenting track record. And this is something Katina and I were just speaking about this morning. We do quite regularly uh, um, to think about the documentation process as more than just your academic performance. And as we we're having a chat this morning, we were really looking at um, or discussing the idea of most of the time we don't really have time to document all of our little outcomes, particularly when we're early career researchers. It's There aren't as many major outcomes such as, for example, a, a really high quality journal or a book chapter, and we think that there are no outcomes. But if we, I guess, look deeper uh, and think of things from a sub outcomes perspective, there are a number of examples that we'd like to share that you can consider documenting and using that as the basis for forming your track record and establishing that track record while you wait for or you work on articles. So for instance, things such as any simulations that you might produce, any tests that you might run, any interviews that might be conducted, these are all outcomes that form part of your broader track record. So really thinking about what do you stand for as a researcher and how do you go about proving it in an in incremental kind of fashion by focusing on those sub outcomes. So if you do think of outcomes, certainly there are journal outcomes, there are conference related outcomes and book chapters, but beneath those or supplement Complementary to those, there are a range of other outcomes at a day to day basis that you might be producing, but not documenting. So it's really important to document and think about um, those types of things. And Katina, perhaps you can also add to that about online storage of outcomes, because I know that's something also that you um, have spoken about previously. Uh, so if we were to focus on those high quality outcomes that I mentioned earlier, um, they take time as well. So, for instance, in the past couple of years, it, it's taken us correct me if I'm wrong, Katia, maybe two to three years for some of those major high quality outcomes to come through and a lot of work. Um, but the point here is, as per the point with grant writing in general, is to keep trying um, and to recognise that different disciplines have different requirements um, in terms of demonstrating uh, a particular quality of an outcome, for example. And um, I might hand over to you just for the metadata, Katina, because I know you've got a lot to say on that point. Um, and then we can delve deeper into some of those practical exercises. Thank you, Reba. Yes, it's always so important to be documenting what we're doing uh, because as many of you know who have attempted uh, to submit uh, grant proposals, we are often judged predominantly by our track record. And so it's a chicken and egg problem at the beginning of our careers. Do I write a grant or do I write some papers because how do I prove that I'm actually worthy of a sum of money from the ARC or an un, another funding source. Uh, so it is this uh, process of weighing up where do we begin and with what. And uh, I would say just steady as we go early on. Um, I know the pressure is on, particularly if you haven't published during your PhD or published uh, papers that perhaps um, a few, uh, but high quality, uh, there is this uh, constant feeling that we should be publishing and we should always be writing that's for sure um, the metadata is almost data about your outcomes and understanding your outcomes you know as doers uh, we are often doing but we are spending less and less time perhaps reflecting on why why are we writing to this particular outlet how will that contribute to a possible grant proposal in the future Am I really interested in this domain? Uh, have I moved on? Uh, and so metadata, you will always be asked about your outcomes, whether it's your boss at work, uh, you know, your school discipline leader, uh, your dean, uh, some external body, uh, the IEEE, you will always be asked, you know, send me your most up-to-date CV. Even perhaps when you're getting into the box seat of becoming an examiner of someone else's PhD. And that's an interesting process uh, where you're often, if you are approached by an overseas institution, told, can you send us a short CV? And so just keeping on top of that data about data, and here we're talking about our outcomes. Um, I know early on the wonderful Professor Jennifer Seabury uh, from the School of Computing, a cybersecurity expert, used to say to us, every single time we'd meet in a research open a forum, um, 
are you documenting your outcomes? You know, and we're so busy doing most of the time that we are not documenting our outcomes. Um, that's all I think I'll say. There are software platforms, the IEEE uh, has, a, you know, Code Ocean and other kinds of opportunities to, um, you know, if you submit a full paper, you can actually uh, submit also a soft copy of a simulation or an Excel spreadsheet or other things. So IEEE is a good place where uh, you can place your outcomes as downloadable chunks that are sourced and referenced and can be referenced by others. So would you believe they might not reference your journal article, but they might ref reference the simulation software you built uh, and give it some credence um, because it can be actually referenced and can be cited. Um, this is just like a different kind of work. So for the artists, for example, in the School of uh, Art and Design, an artwork could be an outcome. And for you, it could be a piece of software. So uh, platforms like figshare.org um, encourage us to think about projects and then within the projects to think about phases of the project and then as outcomes to actually upload chunks like in 20 interviews or um, uh, a model we created or different uh, phases of an algorithm development that we're engaged in, uh, use case scenarios, operational scenarios and so forth. And so Figshare.org is one of many platforms. Archive.org is another, but Figshare more towards project outcomes. We've spoken about this before, actually, and done the exercise of trying to capture or reflect on either the past, the present and the future, particularly in the context of our PhD, for example, and how we can go about thinking about things from a practical setting and documenting things to allow us to plan for the future. So it's a nice exercise to think about the, your PhD project and using that as a springboard to other grant opportunities or the, to the grant writing project and trying to capture what it is that you do in five words. So what was your PhD on or your postdoc or any RA work that you've done? And is there a natural evolution or gap? So for instance, in the prior project that I spoke about, our initial ARC discovery grant, we use that um, as a, a means of articulating future gaps on numerous levels. And I'll give you an example. So the topic area was, in less than five words, location-based services regulation. Um, in terms of the natural evolution, while there are, um, we were focusing on advanced location-based services, now we've transitioned that project to focus on uh, next generation or future modes of operation where location-based services are concerned. So going from those advanced um, device-centered or centric solutions right through to those that are based on Internet of Things, architectures, artificial intelligence, and going beyond those advanced location-based services. So that was a natural progression in that particular area. And that was to give you context, part of my PhD dissertation leading on to additional work over the course of, I think now it's a uh, just over 10 year period of that body of work. So that's at the actual topic area, uh, evolution of topic area. Additionally, at the theoretical level, so we were using a lot of um, uh, base theories or paradigms such as open systems theory, systems theory, and a derivative of that, which is socio-technical systems theory. And as part of the process and that um, discovery grant and our work since, we uh, have determined that there are gaps in the base theory that require some kind of enhancement or extension. So we've used that as the natural evolution into future projects and future funding opportunities. And at the methodological level where methodologies are um, participatory in nature, there are also some research gaps. So it was really nice to be able to articulate. And we did this exercise many, many years ago um, where we were thinking, how do we define in a really succinct manner what my PhD is about, for instance, what the natural evolution is in a number of different ways. So topic specific, theoretically, methodologically, and in our case, we were talking about um, emerging technologies and the socio-ethical and socio-technical implications in addition to the regulatory. So we were able to also transition that knowledge and those approaches over to other emerging technologies, not just confined to location-based services. Uh, something else that we might wish to reflect on are our our center or institution relationships. So how we, or our, um, I guess, affiliation with particular centers within a university setting, or perhaps even external institutions, and what our role and contribution is in light of our research and our research trajectory. Um, something that's really important is the research in the next 
five years and beyond. So uh, some often when we do some of our planning, Katina and I might look even beyond the five year mark in reflecting on the past and then projecting into the future. So what topics do we want to explore? As I said, are they domain or topic specific? Do they relate to theory? Are they methodological in nature? what is the nature of those um those contributions or those gaps or where we hope to contribute and also the long-term trajectory so what do you want to be known for can you actually articulate that particular vision if you were to be known for one thing what would that be so is it about theory building and extensions to theory is it about practice or is it about your impact within a particular discipline or domain and these are all things that you can do so tracking from the phd or your phd dissertation even prior to that so we started work with my honors and then tried to you know think about where this is going and we still reflect on that past presently to define and articulate that um i guess research journey and make sure we're capturing all the learnings lessons and insights across um a lot of that time frame uh feel free to add anything you like there katina uh, before i, I hand just, over to you i just think rover um you know i i consider our academic collaborative work a type of chemistry actually because as you say we're constantly reflecting and looking back at the hooks and the uh, output that we've created together uh, through different kinds of dynamics, whether uh, you've been studying, I've been studying, uh, there have been opportunities where you've led, I've led, we've co-led, um, different ideas come through and we're able to look back and say, ah, do you remember that time that we did? And then we say, aha, because that now has somehow catapulted itself back into our agenda when we least expected it to. Um, and I, I find that interesting from a historical perspective, because perhaps for our members today who are listening to us in the audience, um, as you said, the, the natural organic way to form collaborations, uh, it all takes time. And the longer we are able to be together, the greater the collaborative outcomes. And um, it's just like an exponential curve. Uh, you're working so hard over such a long time. Uh, you're paying each other great respect by listening constantly and uh, taking on each other's feedback, uh, allowing oneself to be renewed by the critical responses and then saying, right, now where to next? But the longer you stay into something, the dividends start to grow exponentially. That's one thing that I, I want you to take away. And, and so youth is the blessing actually of having an opportunity to look around and say, now, who might it be? And who it might be that you collaborate with might be the least person you expect, actually, maybe from a completely different discipline that you haven't thought of working together with, uh, maybe a student, maybe a research assistant that's come on board that you met through uh, an employment um, job advert. It could be from any which way. I, I think um, I was very fortunate that once I uh, did receive that ARC discovery grant early on, that Rover was actually available uh, leaving industry to come back to university and to work on that grant as if it was a full-time job. And so I thought as a, as a grant recipient of the ARC, I really thought I hit the jackpot as well with one of Rover's peers, uh, Dr. Anas Aladat from the University of Jordan, who's now in uh, the UAE working in the area of intelligence. But it's just, you always hope to have this co-mixture and when it gels, it gels don't let those relationships fall away but also they have to be cultivated over time i know when uh, i moved away we could have separated perhaps roba also when you moved away uh, with your industry work and other things you could have moved away but we've always remained in touch and always said now what's the next goal to that project and i could say that even after so many years we're still plotting on how to exploit the outcomes and the research and uh, uh, data collection that we did back in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and then uh, subsequent many projects. So it's an amazing thing to receive a grant. And often we think we need to get many grants. Friends, I think we need to get one grant. And whether that's a small grant, whether that's um, a Global Challenges cross-disciplinary grant, whether it's a travel grant or whether it's a grant that says, you know, here's some startup money because you've started a new job, or it is in fact a competitive national grant like an ARC linkage or an ARC discovery. Celebrate it, embrace it and say, 
yes, I'd love to write another grant very quickly, but actually, what does it mean to have a single grant and how will I utilize that money, which you often do receive and think, uh oh, I now have a research bank account. What am I going to do with the money? The pressure is on to spend and then to find the right people to work alongside you um, as a chief investigator. So with that, um, I guess the qualities of a researcher, and I'd like uh, some interaction with you. Uh, here are my uh, our uh, suggestions for what are the great qualities in a researcher. On the right, we see a diagram where we talk about the curious person, the visionary, the one that's well read. And these are some of the things that we thought perhaps uh, define a, a, a high quality researcher. Someone who's a risk taker, but a calculated risk taker, someone who can see into the future, but the next important thing to respond to, and someone who's constantly reading. Uh, with that, there are some things that Robert has already mentioned, you know, this love of learning, this love of listening, this love to actually iterate uh, when you are drafting a grant, perhaps. Uh, it's a beautiful feeling when you first see it end to end, you know, from page one to about page 32 or page 40, depending on your track record. But actually, you've gone through n number of iterations and a good first draft may take you somewhere between 20 and 30 days. I don't mean full time days, but that's how much time you have to dedicate to a robust first draft that has all the bits and pieces inclusive of um, a proposal. Uh, your clean track record, uh, your budget, you know, impact statements uh, and other statements that you need to draw from. So iteration has to be something that's embedded in your psyche over and over again, because what is required is attention to minute detail. That's wonderful qualities. Vision with a mix of others and measured a, a good listener. These are all fine things that we have self-identified about our skill set. And it's really important to know where your strengths are, because as you begin to collaborate with others, uh, they'll, they'll want to see certain elements that will help them in the proposal gathering. So meticulous is a wonderful, wonderful quality to have and listening. You can always be the bridge to a group that's perhaps in disagreement about where the grant should go. And, and grants can't be contradictory internally. So being a good listener will allow you to go through and actually create a one voice. Often we say, you know, you do this section, I'll do this section, but the greatest proposals are the one voice proposals where there's not even a minute possibility of contradiction because as soon as a panelist or a reviewer sees contradiction, they say, right, these people are not in coherence with one another or the grant itself, if it was one chief investigator, is not coherent. They're in conflict in themselves about what should be in there. And so enjoying thinking independently is just as important as enjoying thinking in a group. I, I know the joys that I get from independent thinking, but I have to say the joys of working with Roba and others around me is manifold more um, listening and, and, and learning and iterating and thinking. I'm always leaving meetings thinking more. And you can then take that group think back to your independent think and start to see how the group is influencing your direction because you will influence one another in direction. The importance of uh, incorporating critical feedback and the no fear aspect. You know, often people have a fear of, and let's use that word failure, but this isn't about failure, it's about growth. As we move on, I want to take a step back from grant writing itself, and I'm going to introduce to you five exercises. We're actually not going to do them today, but you might do them in your own time. I just want to mentor you through those exercises because I know that Robo and I have actually engaged in a lot of this. Uh, you won't find these examples in textbooks. They're straight out of my head and also uh, influenced by interactions I've had with my closest collaborators like Robo and also many other mentors in the past. Um, so if I was to sit down, before I even think grants, have I given myself time to plan? Because grants can be a reactive modality. You know, you go to work, you receive an email in your inbox that says, hey, you know, I've got a good idea. You want to write a grant together? It's on this. And you say, yeah, I'm going to meet with you. But you really haven't considered as yet 
not your contribution, because you probably know what your contribution might be to the greater project proposal, but what you're about. So just like when you were doing your PhD, someone would say, tell me what domain you were in. If I ask you as a researcher, tell me what space you play in and tell me what's around that space and how you're going to get there in the next five years. So let's just simplify things. My first apology is the shooting star motif, to draw an arrow on a blank A4 page and to date it year one through to year five. It's helpful if you use real dates like 2022, 2023, and always think year end if that's where you're coming from. So if in Australia, we go to December as a year end. So December 2022, uh, 23, 24, 25, 26. And at each one of those dots, these equidistant dots, I just want you to add where do you want to be in terms of your research? Now, you can think about this in various ways, and there may be different colour codes that you might use. One might be about writing your first national competitive grant, and the dots year to year might represent, I'm going to draft it this year, I'm going to submit it in the year after. Or it might well be phases of that grant, independent of whether you get the money or not. So in year one, I, I do this, you know, in year two, I do this, in year three, year four, year five. And we'll go through different topologies in a moment where you can extrapolate that out. But really, you've got to begin with the roadmap. So before I'm even thinking about grants, grants are just one element of a research agenda. Um, publication is another. Teaching research nexus is another. And so they all have to do with research, but they're all very sort of different goals. And they all interrelate and they all integrate, right? So if I'm able to create um, a path, a publication path, where I say, building on my PhD, building on my first small grant, building on a larger grant, now I have a stepping stone. Because unless you're trying to tie disparate areas together, you need to show track record. You need to show nuanced strategy in your research. And in the next apology, more of that drilling down business, because in my mind is if I can look at my research coverage, I know where my boundaries are. And often when you're building um, mobile networks, you talk about cells, the cellular architecture. And the reason why engineers have used cellular system motifs throughout all engineering sort of domains is because the hexagon actually can fit neatly and coverage can be very complete. And even though I'm talking in abstract terms, I want you to think about your research like this. It's a coverage. And so in this second topology, I want you to start in the center. And if I was to ask you now to again use the chat, what's that center bubble? What do you want to be known for at the end of your career? And so that's your field of research. And that should tie into your four codes in the ARC. And so that's one hexagon with our joining areas. I would create another hexagon, maybe with theories, algorithms, top researchers in the field, what they're researching in. And so I then have this hexagonal architecture that looks up, it has to look like a beehive, right? And what do we know? Honey, right? That's what you're looking for. You're looking to actually be able to look down and say, right, in these cells is who I am as a researcher. And so I have one sort of bubble here that has additional hexagons and I could go out layer two, layer three, layer four. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing my research being expanded into domains that could be possibly what? Areas of research, grant proposals. And so try that exercise at home for me until you can't do any more architectural sort of hexagons and can't fill any more hexagons in with words, but always starting with the centrality and then working out one layer, two layer at a time. And then once you've finished one of the hexagon architectures, start another one and then start to look at it with a four pieces in your room or on the floor at home or at the office, look down and say, now, where do I sit? Where am I? With topology three, um, this is more a scoping exercise as we've already got the hexagonal architectures out there. 
now we're starting to say, right, we're starting to translate those areas and topics of interest into potential grants. And so here are these bubbles, and I break it down almost as if it's a thesis, but there are some components that are different. And so you've already gone through a grant, either as a fundee, you received a scholarship, or as an RA, or as doing somebody else's research. Now it's time for you to empower yourself and say, I can go back to that same group, or I can try my own way as well. And I would encourage a bit of both. Independent submissions of grants is fantastic. So are joint grants. There are different things to gain from each. And so start to put keywords. Don't draft the whole grant out. Don't sit there in front of Microsoft Word or Google Docs and go, I'm going to write the grant end to end. I want you to go through this activity many times and writing keywords in the theory, whatever makes sense instead of theory, perhaps conceptual framework. In the literature, what literature am I citing? Who am I citing? How is that playing out? The methodology, what is it going to look like in terms of phases? Um, that central theme that I'm preoccupied with, which is the biggest bubble there in the middle, and I should have started off with, which, which is really the domain, but also that gap that you're playing in and then a budget. And again, don't scratch your head thinking, oh, you know, I need to get to the, to the minute dollar figure. What I want you to do is to look at your method and start playing around with who might I need to execute this massive grant or what hardware, even though hardware is not a, a ticket item for most ARC projects, but think about the process. Think about the people you're going to engage on that budget and then the impact. What does it mean the socioeconomic benefits, the national benefits and everything else the ARC asks you to write about. And so once you've done this activity, you're almost close to actually writing the actual grant application. And so you may have a project list. You might do that activity 10 times. You might actually have um, a list of projects that are ready to go saying, OK, I'm going to prospectively put that in an ARC grant or I'm going to keep it there on the side. It might be an ad hoc. Um, opportunity um, that's a commercial opportunity um, or I might be agile I might be in reactive mode so you're constantly writing towards these grant proposals and when they become available uh, you start to submit what you have been working on but also if there is something reactionary that actually does suit your research agenda I would go forward uh, and take that on in topology four I'm asking you here to think about your research network so if we are going to do joint proposals, then we are actually thinking about who we're going to work with. Um, defining that network is very important. Uh, are they people who you've previously co-authored with? That's an easy potential collaborator. Are they someone in your school that you admire their research and you think, well, I could do something with that person? Have you approached them to say, you know, I'd like to work with you? Uh, uh, and be forthright in your own way, uh, whichever way you feel is comfortable, because I know sometimes that's very difficult and very complex. Uh, you're unsure uh, on, on what process to approach people, but start with the people in your centre. And your centre director may well tell you, you know, I think you'd be a good pair up. Um, you know, have a go at this. Uh, or here's, you know, some uh, seed, seed money, you know, up to two, three thousand dollars. See what you can do with that. And so often these are encouraging you to navigate towards certain people, but you need to understand the different roles, uh, chief investigator, uh, partner investigator, but knowing who you're gonna write with and having developed some track record with these individuals means you have a greater chance of being funded. And here are sort of your, again, your three types. Uh, often we just think ARC is a single source uh, that we may be able to be funded on. Um, but there are other international recognised grant websites that you could go to. Uh, the European Union could take you on, perhaps as a partner investigator. I know in Canada recently, uh, I submitted a grant with a group from the University of Waterloo, which was uh, being a collaborator, purely a collaborator. That's not a PI, a partner investigator. That's not a chief investigator. It's a collaborator if we are funded. Ask your institutional research office. Often, uh, I know at ASU, we have the Knowledge Enterprise, which is like our equivalent of the research office in Australia. They may have a database you can access to understand the grants, but they also may be tapping you on the shoulder, saying, we think you would be suitable for this grant. And then 
in an ad hoc way, there are grants that are often uh, presented to us as opportunities from the local, state and federal government. They're often advertised in online newspapers or other public spaces, but there have been whole research groups that have actually responded to ad hoc opportunities like uh, tenders for local grants uh, for local government or state government. Please look out for those as well as additional funding sources. Uh, finally, as you start to do these roadmaps, as you start to look at the grant um, writing process, those sheets of paper that I'm asking you uh, with Robo to, to brainstorm through and reflect on, you might actually share with people you trust. This might well be your previous PhD supervisor. This may well be a co-author who's at the same rate of presentation and development as you. Uh, this may well be a family member uh, who's also educated, but maybe not. Um, you're constantly receiving feedback from very different people about the grant writing process, but also your grant ideas and also your research ideas. Um, I would say informally, fellow collaborators, peers, uh, your associate dean of research and your institution's research office, but seek feedback before you start writing the grant. Seek feedback before you submit the grant and then take on the feedback during the rejoinder process after reviews. Um, time management. Uh, as a as a young mum, uh, many years ago, um, I I knew I had so many things to share, uh, and uh, would often leave it too late. And so the ideas weren't the problem; the actual end to end application was. And um, that's the main issue. It's not competence. It's not that our ideas are poor. It's time. And so it, when I said, you know, it takes twenty to thirty days to write a good grant you know, it probably takes more. Sure you'll add to this, Katina. That's something I've worked my way through over the past three to four years, Naila, of trying to demonstrate how within my particular discipline or area, uh, I can demonstrate track record and sustain track record over time. I believe that there's a, um, I'm just trying to, think about this, but I believe there is an area within the uh, DECRA grant application which asks you to talk about your track record uh, relative to your particular discipline. Um, so I've gone through an exercise separate to this as part of a different writing process where I've written what the disciplinary requirements are and what constitutes uh, acceptable track record. Uh, and that's something that I derived from literature in the domain to sort of say in the information systems domain, this is what is considered uh, a suitable H index or um, although there are some concerns around those kind of metrics because they're not, as you rightly stated, an accurate representation of what you are or who you are as a researcher, demonstrated, um, I guess, stealth as a researcher and, and so on. So I think it's part of building that narrative. So this is the area that I'm playing in as part of that area. These are the disciplinary norms and this is what is considered um, uh, acceptable. This is how things work and just sort of um, almost handhold in terms of explaining that. I mean, ideally, um, your grant application would go to someone within that discipline who's aware of those. But I know certainly now being in the Faculty of Business and law, we have our own requirements. We adhere largely to the um, ABDC list, which defines, um, uh, I guess, or identifies uh, journals and publication outlets on a ranking based systems of A star right through to, to um, other ranks. And uh, A star is obviously the, the, the peak or the, what we're ideally aiming for. And then there's A, so we can easily talk to that. In terms of citations, I think uh, framing it in the way that you have framed it. Um, and being able to demonstrate that. So I found, as I said, um, uh, talking about disciplinary norms, tapping into existing scholarship that demonstrates what I'm saying and sort of verifies what I'm saying, and then also just building it into the general narrative. So saying this is my research program, it has been built over time, this is where I'm at, um, this is what's happened in the past, this is where I'm going and this is why this grant actually fits within that broader trajectory and I'm the most suitable individual to um, to achieve this. Thank you so much, Professor Katina, and thank you to Roba for just uh, such a wonderful, wonderful um, talk and amazing tip. I have learned a lot today. So uh, if you have any other uh, question, guys, please, um, the email address of Roba and Katina are in the, um, chat, in the chat box. Uh, please feel free to contact them. And thank you so much for an amazing talk. Um, and I would like to acknowledge all our 
um, uh, co-sponsors in this as well. That was uh, Kamal from New Zealand. She was from SE University. Uh, they are co-sponsoring from WIE New Zealand Central Section and our NSWIP and WREN from uh, University of Wollongong. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. bye everyone.